I would like to invite Srimati Praminder Chopra, Chairperson and Managing Director, to address the gathering. Good evening and warm welcome to all of you. This is our first investor meet one to one after the COVID time. And I am happy to see a good turnaround from our investor community. Today morning, PFC result for fourth quarter and financial year ending March 2024 has been declared. And I am happy to share that we have again delivered a remarkable performance. I'll start with PFC's consolidated performance. At a group level, PFC continues to deliver strong performance year on year. We continue to be the largest NBFC group in India with a consolidated balance sheet size of 10.40 lakh crore. For FY 2024, the consolidated PAT stood at 26,461 crore, that is 25% increase from the previous financial year. The group loan asset book registered a growth of 16%. On the asset quality front, we continue to see a decreasing trend in our NPA levels. The consolidated net NPA ratio for FY24 stands at 0.85% as against 1.03% in FY2023. Now moving on to standalone performance. First of all, I'm happy to share that we have closed the year on a high note by delivering a all-time high annual profit of 14,367 crores, a 24% increase from the previous financial year. With this, PFC is now the highest profit-making NBFC in India. I am satisfied to see that our bottom line is growing year on year. This is largely driven by our improving margins while ensuring prudence in provisioning, risk management, and governance. Our steadily increasing profits enable us to maximize returns to our valued investors and shareholders year on or year. I am pleased to share that the board has proposed a final dividend of two and a half rupee per share, the payout which for which shall happen after the AGM approval. With this, the dividend for FY24 has reached to rupees 13 rupees 50 paisa per share. This dividend is complemented by the bonus of one raise to four already given out in this financial year. So if I talk on a pre-bonus levels, the dividend per share would have been rupees 16 rupees 88 paisa per share. Now talking of the key financial ratios, we have been sharing that we are targeting a spread in the range of 2.5%. I am happy to share that we have achieved a spread of 2.64% with a net interest margin of 3.46% for FY 2024. The spread is mainly driven by stable yield and improvement in cost of funds in FY24. The yield for FY24 stands at 10.01%. On the cost side, there is a reduction, considerable reduction from last financial year and stood at cost of funds stood at 7.37%. The market since last year has been quite volatile, so we have been keeping tight control on the cost of funds. We are maintaining our costs through an active 
liability management strategy which is focused on one replacing high cost debt as and when window of opportunity is available then maintaining a mix of floating and fixed rate borrowing and lastly the balancing between the domestic and the foreign currency borrowing last year we have raised approximately 1 lakh crore in line with our strategic approach to maintain a diversified mix 18% of our fund raising was through foreign currency borrowing which is has a mix of short term and long term funding while talking about the foreign currency borrowing i would like to mention that we have a very active treasury desk for managing the risk right now 88% of our portfolio is hedged for the exchange rate as against 66% last year more than 90% of the exchange rate is risk is hedged for portfolios having a residual maturity of up to 5 years and if i talk of the residual maturity up to 5 years for us dollar denominated portfolio 100% of the exchange risk is covered these numbers give us the confidence to say that we can hold on to the our bottom line in a situation of wide foreign exchange currency fluctuations in future also our strong capital adequacy ratio of 25% and a robust net worth of more than 79000 crore builds a financial resilience and gives comfort in managing future uncertainties while talking about resilience i would like to discuss our asset quality in for more than a year we have not added any new npa we continue to maintain 74% provisioning on our the npa portfolio which is at the similar level as that of the last year owning to our prudent provisioning and active efforts for resolution our net npas have reduced to 0.85% from 1.07% in the previous year here i would also like to mention that in last 5 years our npa book has reduced by nearly 50% our current gross npa levels are at 3.34% right now we have a total npa book of 16000 crores which comprises of 21 projects out of this 13 projects worth approximately 14000 crores are being resolved through nclt of which seven projects amounting to 2600 crore are under liquidation the remaining eight projects worth 2200 crore are being resolved outside nclt out of these 21 stressed project two projects with outstanding amount of 2900 crore that is 18% of the total npa book are in advanced stage of resolution first is the lenco amarkantak project which is which has the outstanding of 2400 crores it's a 1920 megawatt thermal generation project the resolution has been submitted for nclt approval in march 2024 and the approval is still awaiting as a prudent practice we continue to maintain 76% provisioning for this project as per the resolution plan we expect more than 35% principal recovery the second project is the shiga energy project with an outstanding amount of 522 crores it's a 97 megawatt commissioned hydro energy project for this the resolution is being 
envisaged outside NCIT. The restructuring plan has been finalized. PFC has given its approval for the plan and other lenders are in the process of obtaining approval. Currently, we have 31% pro provisioning on the asset and we expect 100% pr principal recovery out of the resolution plan for the, this asset. With the resolution of these two assets, we expect our NPAs to come down uh, under three. I would like to share the developments in other two stressed assets where the resolution process has progressed. One is the KSK Mahanadi project with an outstanding of 3,300 crore. It's a 3,600 megawatt coal-based project. This project is under NCLT. Last month, expression of interest was issued and active participation has see, was seen with 26 expression of interest being received. And we will be floating RFP soon. For this project, we are already maintaining 55% provisioning. Another asset is the Sinnar Thermal Power Project with an outstanding amount of 3,000 crore. It's a 1,350 megawatt coal-based plant. The project was admitted under NCLT in September 2022, and resolution proceedings were stayed in the same month. Now the stay has been vacated, and expression of interest was published in March 24. 16 expression of interest has been received and in this also, we will be floating RFP soon. We are maintaining 80% provisioning in this project. On the overall provisioning front, there is no change in the stage three provisioning during the year. And we have continued to maintain 74% provisioning similar as last year. We believe that these provisioning levels are adequate. As a prudent mayor, management exercised its discretion for ECL overlay. Accordingly, we have additionally created provisioning on standard assets, that is stage one and stage two assets, to the tune of approximately 800 crore during the year. Currently, we have provisions of around 0.85% on standard assets. Now I would like to discuss on two key areas impacting PFC. First is the PFC's loan book, and second is the impact of the recent RBI draft RBI, draft RBI guidelines for projects under implementation. On the loan book front, I am delighted to share that in FY24, we have successfully delivered on our promise. PFC has registered a double-digit growth of 14% in the loan assets. Here, I would like to share that our renewable book has achieved 25% year-on-year growth. With this, the renewable loan portfolio is around 60,000 crores. The loan asset growth was driven by the strong disbursements of 1,27,660 crore during the year. While talking about the loan book, I would like to emphasize that PFC's earning asset book is close to 4,95,000 after considering investment of rupees 14,500 crore in REC. The investment in REC is akin to our loan assets as it is not part of our routine investment. It represents capital which would have otherwise been deployed for lending. The REC investment has provided a return of around 15% this year. If we consider the total returns on our earning book, including REC investments, 
our yield is at 10.18% and the spread is at 2.81%. From the overall earning perspective, PFC's asset book is delivering strong returns. This is further reflected with our position as India's highest profit-making NBFC. Now let's shift gear to our future loan growth strategy. Here, I want to emphasize that our strategy for building resilience. PFC is a systemically important NBFC managing asset book of 4.95 lakh crore on a standalone basis. For a company as big as PFC, it's important that the growth we achieve today enables the company to sustain and grow for decades to come. Now, if we see the operating environment is becoming increasingly complex and challenging over the years. Interest rates are at the highest level in over a decade. Inflation continues to rise. Market volatility persists and geopolitical environment is ever-changing. These recent challenges have brought forward the importance of maintaining long-term financial stability for an organization. Therefore, today's environment demands that companies should have a steadier financial foundation with a stable profit growth, which is resilient to handle uncertainties. With this in mind, in PFC, we are guided by the motto of three R's, realistic, resilient, and robust loan growth. We are focused on expanding our loan book in a way that continues to sustain over the years, delivers a steady bottom line, and maintain robust asset quality. The goal is to strike a balance between value and volume, enabling us to achieve consistent year-on-year -year growth and build a stronger and more resilient PFC. With this approach, we expect to have a similar loan book growth in the next financial year also. Key drivers for growth will include business, in energy transition space, such as traditional solar and wind, and energy solutions, storage solution, coupled with lending in the distribution space, majorly under RBPF scheme. Also, until renewable reaches critical masses to meet energy demand and energy stability, funding for conventional generation will be needed for energy security. This will be another potential lending area for PFC. Till now, we have supported 50% of the installed capacity, and we expect to maintain our market share in a similar range. Additionally, lending in the infrastructure sector will also contribute incrementally to our loan asset growth. <clears throat> Overall, our growth in the next few years will come from a diversified mix of opportunity within the power and infrastructure sector. To give an overview on the energy transition, Mr. Mayank from USAID will make a presentation today this evening. However, I would like to briefly touch upon the improvements happening in the distribution space, which is a critical link to the value chain. As you may be aware, PFC, as part of its developmental role, has been partnering with Government of India for bringing in improvement in the sector, and is acting as the nodal agency for government reform schemes. PFC has been undertaking the rating exercise for past many number of years. Recently, the 12th integrated rating and ranking of the power distribution utilities 
has been released. This is an annual exercise being done to assess the performance of the DISCOMs. If we compare the results with the 11th rating report, there have been significant improvements. ATNC losses have decreased to 15.4% in FY23 from 16.2% in FY22, inching closer to the national goal of 12 to 15%. Billing efficiency has improved to 87% from 86% in FY22. With the implementation of the late payment surcharge scheme, the number of days of payable to DISCOMs, of DISCOMs to GENCOs and TRANSCOs have reduced from 166 days to 126 days in FY23. Here, I would like to share that after implementation of the LPS rules, 72% of the legacy dues has been paid. Timely tariff orders are issued for 26 states and union territories for FY24 as compared to 20 in FY23 and 14 in FY22. So the results of the reform mayors and financing scheme implementing is visible. This is positive for the overall health of the power sector. Let's now turn to the draft RBI circular for projects under implementation. We understand that one of the key concerns of the investors on these regulations is the potential impact on the provisioning. On this first thing, we would like to clarify that for the purpose of asset classification and provisioning, PFC is applying NDAS methodology of expected credit loss. As per RBI guidelines, any incremental provisioning required under IGAP over and above NDAS norms needs to be created through impairment reserve and not through P&L. So any provisioning impact under these draft guidelines will not have any immediate impact on company's profitability. Right now, the nuances of the circulars are still being discussed among the financial institutions. So the, uh, to assess the impact in medium to long term, we need more clarity. Just to give an idea, if we see our current outstanding book, around 25% of the total book is under construction. Now, based on our preliminary understanding, the provisioning requirement primarily for projects under construction phase where DCCO extension has been opted. In the under construction portfolio, around 45% are conventional generation projects which are generally long gestation and where DCCO usually gets extended. The balance towards renewable and transmission and distribution projects, they are comparatively of shorter gestation. So if RBI clarifies on this understanding for applying provisioning only on cases where DCCO extension has been opted, the potential impacted portfolio would be much less. Here I would like to mention that currently we are maintaining an average combined provision of nearly 0.85% on stage one and stage two assets. Now the next concern is that the additional provisioning may require higher capital to be maintained for the project. So first question is how we will manage this and whether this increase in capital would increase the project lending cost. On this, I would like to share currently, we have a robust capital adequacy level of 25% as against the regulatory requirement of 15%. The tier one capital is at 23% against the requirement of 10%. 
these numbers give us adequate comfort for future credit growth. On the future capital Im impact on capital, the situation is dynamic as the implementation of the draft circular is still being discussed. But RBI is focused on protecting the capital levels of financial institutions and is open to understanding the concern. The circular is being discussed among the financial institution and if something material emerges, the same will be taken up with RBI. Having said that, if any need arise to shore up capital, PFC is well equipped to raise perpetual debt from the domestic and international market. And we have sufficient and adequate cushion available under RBI limits for this. Given our ability to raise capital, I expect the business to go continue as usual without impacting the growth. Now, any additional capital would impact the lending cost. But it will all depend on future clarity and final guidance from RBI and also how the interest rate regime is playing. The situation is still evolving and we will share impact as and when more clarity is received. Before I conclude, I want to emphasize that PFC is actively taking steps to su support the growth of power sector in India, including the energy transition goals. In this direction, in FY24, PFC has set up uh, its subsidiary, PFC Infra Finance IFSC Limited, in IFSC Gift City, Gujarat. We are the first government-owned NBFC to set up operations in the IFSC gift city. This subsidiary will provide foreign currency lending to drive the power sector's growth. We have already made a capital infusion of 100 crore in the subsidy. We see IFSC subsidiary as a promising avenue to finance India's growth. To conclude, we believe that our commitment to excellence combined with robust fundamentals positions PFC well to leverage future growth opportunity. Thank you very much. And now we are open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have the Q&A. As you raise your hand, we'll have a volunteer come up to you with the mic. You're requested to kindly introduce yourself and the name of the company. Hi, thank you. My name is Shreya. I'm from CLSA. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first is on the, uh, on the RBI regulation and the current loan book. So uh, wanted a clarification that of your DISCOM and short-term loans, how much would be considered as project finance? Uh, will all of your DISCOM loans be considered as project finance? I mean, our uh, LPS and our PPF loans ideally shouldn't be considered, but what is your view and understanding on the same? And second, ma'am, is on the uh, thermal capex. So we've, uh, basis media articles and peer commentary, we've heard there's about 94 gigawatt of uh, thermal capex getting planned, of which 74 would be non-NTPC. So uh, your loan growth guidance of 12 to 15 percent, does it account for the, this thermal capex coming in? Uh, uh, what is your view on it? And when do you think the thermal capex will actually start moving on ground? With respect to the discount lending, especially under the schemes, which is LPS, LIS, and RPPS, these are non-project loans. So as per our understanding, the RBI circular, the recent draft guidelines shall not apply to that. Ma'am, how much, how much would be this of your total discom? Uh, I think substantial part is around 70% would be, Should be LPS. of the discom uh, portfolio will be on these schemes. On the, your second question about the addition in the uh, thermal generation capex for that part. So we are open to funding that, 
But as you rightly said, that most of it is coming under NTPC, and NTPC is central sector, and they are not a borrower from PFC. So if something is coming up in the states, we are open to that, and we would be funding that. That may be coming in. in there are certain projects on which it's an ongoing disbursement. Projects have been sanctioned, but the capacities are yet to come, or the project are yet to be commissioned. So on that front, we, are, we will be disbursing right now also. But if new schemes are coming, then we will be planning accordingly. Ma'am, just to follow up on the traditional or the thermal uh, Genco book. Uh, so uh, a, a peer analysis simply shows that there are these electrical and mechanical kind of projects which also get clubbed in the thermal, uh, in the Genco book for, for our peer. So uh, do we not participate in such projects or, or because the trend is PFC's uh, thermal gen or the traditional Genco book has been either flat or declining. While for a peer, that book has been growing. And the main reason for growth there has been participation in these ENM kind of loans. So uh, are we not participating in those? What are, we, uh, what are our views on the same? See, what I understand, I can't say about the peers, but for PFC, the generation portfolio which we are showing is the purely generation portfolio. No E&M portion has been clubbed into this. So the ENM portion, you don't participate, or it's not it's not even in the other loan book, or it's, it's no, no. It definitely uh, we participate under ENM, but it doesn't appear into the gym because it doesn't lead to generation. There are electromechanical component in some of the uh, schemes where we participate. So that is appearing in the other loan book. Got it. Very useful. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Andre Purushottam. Um, uh, we are part of a family office, me and my wife, um, and we are shareholders in your company. Uh, first of all, ma'am, uh, can I congratulate you and your team for an outstanding performance? Uh, it was really hard for me to hear. I had two questions. One was on the cost front, and if you can break it up both into borrowing costs and operating costs. As far as operating costs are concerned, are there any levers that you have to drive further efficiencies, either in terms of retirals of senior and expensive personnel or cost uh, reductions that can happen with the aid of technology. That's one part of the question. And as far as the borrowing costs are concerned, you referred to the um, retiral of high cost debt. So are there significant opportunities that you see in the next one or two years in that area? And therefore, can we see a significant uh, reduction, uh, either as a percentage or otherwise of costs going forward in the next one or two years? <coughs> That's my first question. Yeah. On the operational cost, uh, cost you are referring, so considering the PFC's overall revenue, so that is, the portion is negligible. What I can share, the maximum amount is the CSR expenditure, 2%, which we have to incur. Otherwise, our costs are very minuscule because as far as the manpower is concerned, we are a very lean organization. So that doesn't contribute to major operational costs for us. On the other side, what was your next question? On the borrowing cost, ma'am. On the borrowing cost. Retiral of high cost debt and any other measures that could be taken to reduce uh, your costs and therefore improve your margins. Yeah. The borrowing consists of two types of loans. One is the bonds, which we borrow from the market and is at, are at fixed rate but there we don't have any prepayment option. The other part is the loans from the banks where the rates are floating, but along with the prepayment option, and generally they are priced a bit higher than the bond prices since they have the prepayment facility. So what retirement of expensive loan or uh, high cost loan we were referring, that was primarily the term loans we have borrowed from the banks. Either banks have decided to reduce the interest rate for lending to PFC in the existing loan, or after prepayment, they have lended to PFC at a lesser rate later. And one more question I had, Ben, was on risks. Uh, you've done very well in the last two years. Uh, are there any significant risks that you can foresee in the next year or two that would be confronted in the next two years? See, one, that on the credit cost, I think provisioning front, 
we have sufficient cushion built in both on stage 1 stage 2 as well as on stage 3 asset so we are not seeing any additional major risk on that front but as we grow and as our regulator increases the compliance so that could be one of the risks we can like these draft guidelines so everybody all the investors are concerned that what sort of impact it's going to have so that is one risk that can be that is always open from the regulator point of view and the other could be if any major fluctuations in the exchange rate is happening i think these are the two major risks as far as our understanding that is there thank you very much ma okay. hello ma'am shweta here from ilara capital ma'am i have couple of questions so one your peer has already taken provision reversals on the biggest account that is lanco amar kantak so is it that our lgd pd uh, assumptions are different and that's why uh, so why you know like despite having similar accounts why the uh, accounting period on provision reversals is differing and therefore uh, are we expecting this to come by in q1 see what i would request all of you that you may not ask the question with reference to immediate peers you can ask why reversal has not been done by pfc that would be a better way to ask a question sure so as per our policy when we get the final approval and when the resolution plan is implemented so we have been consistently reviewing the provision at that stage so nclt approval is still pending we are waiting for the nclt approval to be received and resolution plan to be implemented after which we will be doing the reversal and obviously when we do the reversal then we will both we will be at the same platform right and ma'am just a related question so you mentioned in your commentary is that uh, we have made additional 800 dot crores of standard asset provisioning on stage 1 and 2 so this is in line with the new draft norms or uh, is it uh, uh, exclusive of that and if so then uh, what led you to put up uh, extra provisioning see this management overlay what we were talking we have already done till q3 so it is not in this particular quarter we have done any management overlay so the draft guidelines have come much later than that right. so this this was done we had some reversals but as a prudent mayor we thought that let us have a st strong asset book and additional provisioning to take care of the any future uncertainties so on that account we have exercised that option and you are seeing that on overall basis we have reversals of just 134 or 24 crores also again related uh, should we imply that the private sector exposure on the renewable side is slightly expanding and are we coming from there see it is once the management uh, overlay is exercised so you can it said in order to build the overall cushion on all the stage one assets we have increased the provisioning to a minimum of 0.4% individually not on the portfolio level so mm -hmm. this was the call management has taken right ma'am one last question and uh, i'll be harping on growth uh, so correct me if, uh, my understanding is correct so we are guiding 12 to 15% loan growth uh, talking about the power sector value chain opportunities so even though you answered in the previous question that on the thermal side largely ntpc is going to pick up uh, from the 94 gigawatt uh, installation capacity that is expected but uh, since we are in initial stages of emerging technologies like battery and storage so there is ample opportunity with thermal coal back in reckoning point number 1 point number 2 on the renewable side we are also expecting 313 uh, extra incremental requirement and we are very low today around 187 and uh, if i take it annual basis we are only 12 gigawatt and i'm not even talking about rooftop solar financing opportunity this on the discom side distribution capex is still ongoing and we have still not explored fully the infra side of the book so we uh, despite this kind of funding opportunity and potential on the across the entire power value chain 
uh, what is leading to slight conservatism in our growth estimates. And just uh, part two of my question, uh, so while you clearly explained that the new RBI draft, uh, draft norms, uh, given the fact that we are high on capital adequacy, it might not even burn our capital to that extent. Um, so, uh, so if you can touch upon these two and tell us uh, where we are coming from on the growth targets, where uh, you know where you have more than 15% growth potential. Thank you. See, we have always been talking about that we will be growing at uh, somewhere between 12 to 15 percent. So you need to appreciate that our base is growing on which we are talking of the growth. So base has increased from 4,57,000 to 4,81,000. So accordingly, the numbers are. We want to give realistic targets which we can achieve and we can sustain over a longer period. It's not that whatever is coming to us, we are funding. We have to build our book to sustain the future of PFC. So that is the motto by which we are going. For you, it maybe seems to be a conservative number, but actuals, whatever we can think of, we are giving. If there is more potential, we are always open to do that if we are finding more commercially viable projects. So we are open for that. On this, your second question about the impact on the of the draft guidelines, I think lot may lot of clarity is required on these guidelines. Still, everybody is interpreting in the more you read, I think more confusion it gives. So on what portfolio you need to apply, how you need to apply, how forward to take it. So all those things are need lot of clarity. We will be giving our comments to RBI and let us see what RBI is coming out whenever they come for the final guidelines. So this much only I can say. Uh, yes. Madam Ramesh Pochwani from Meta and Vakil. Right. We saw your AV presentation before you came. It was playing continuously. And it was so heartening to see that what we have achieved the capacity of our generation of about 230 to 240 gigawatts, we are likely to double going forward in the next five or seven years. And you are positioned exactly at a point from 86 you started to 2024. This asset base and funding will double in the next five years is what I see. Just your thoughts on this. And second, a small thing, the T and D losses have, very heartening to see, have come down to 15.43%. With the help of installation of smart meter, can we not reduce it to a single digit loss so that we are generating power but we are losing it? Essentially, my reading is we are losing it because of power theft. We put it in nice way, TND losses, but it is nothing but a power theft. And with smart meters, we can arrest this power theft. And this TND loss can come down to a single digit, maybe because of long distance transmission, there is a loss. Your thoughts on both these? <laughs> <laughs> so, on doubling the capacity, I would like to share that PFC has supported 50% of the total installed capacity in the country. And 25, if I talk of the renewable capacity, we have supported 25% of the installed capacity. And we hope to continue with our share in the increased capacity of the country. So this could be one. The other thing that there has been substantial reduction in the TND losses. And in some state, this is the average for the country we are discussing. But however, in some states, we are already experiencing TND losses coming in the single digit. Excellent. So there are few states for which this particular average is distorted. So we will, I think, once those states also perform, then overall on the country level, we will be, we can achieve in single digit. And uh, one thought came to my mind with the renewables which you mentioned. 
we need to accelerate and lay extra focus on hydropower. We have a lot of waterfalls. Whenever there is heavy rainfall in the northeast, that water causes destruction so by way of flooding and overflowing and you know whatever other infrastructure we create, it gets destroyed. If we can channelize with the waterways of India, not only we can see the destruction, curb the destruction, we can also reach the water down in the four southern states because in every summer there is a report that people buy a bucket of water for 20 bucks. But hydropower is something which we can generate and put use to uh, an asset. I would like uh, our government nominee director, Mr. Ajay Tiwari, to reply. Yes. <laughs> this is actually a question directed to the government rather than PFC. Yes. <laughs> so uh, as on today, we have a hydropower of around 47 gigawatt in the country, yeah. installed capacity, which includes few projects of PSP also. From 47 gigawatt, now we are trying to, uh, there was a lull in between, as you all know it, uh, because of solar and wind coming at cheaper uh, tariff. So uh, there was a lot of lull in the hydro sector. But now the government has given extra emphasis on the hydropower because which is very stable, which uh, supplements your peak power requirement, yeah. which also balances your RE intermittency into the grid. Yes. So it's a very quality uh, power, electricity. So we have put extra emphasis and in the last, uh, during last year itself, in the month of August, if you would have heard, in the, heard or read in the newspapers, that in the Arunachal Pradesh itself, Government of India signed 13 memorandum of understandings for 13 projects of 13 gigawatt. Test 13 projects of around 13 gigawatt in one day. And in so one state. In one state. So that is Arunachal has got so much hydro potential as you said. Yes. In the northeast, Arunachal Pradesh has almost has 60 percent. Uh, power potential. So that is what we are tapping. Apart from that, in the other states also, we have taken a new scheme which is going to be uh, approved very soon, which will be like central financial assistance in the form of equity to the state governments up to so that they can participate in each hydro projects up to 24%. So that they also get involved into the project fully and they also get the revenues later on. So similar uh, steps are being taken into other states also, like Jammu and Kashmir, a lot of projects are coming up. And uh, you, you will soon see a, a, a rise of hydropowers again in the country. But in terms of percentage in the energy mix, that is about to, that is to remain around 12%, even till 2047, because solar and wind, yeah. RE is coming up. We have taken a target of 500 gigawatt in the country. Yes. So uh, that is all. And sir, one thing you did not address correctly is that when we have excess water, say, in the northeast, causing damage and destruction to whatever infrastructure or living we have created, but the same water, if we can channelize through by forming a waterways or a riverways of India, from north northeast to complete south, we can eliminate this water shortage forever for the entire nation. So that will be taken care of if the projects are multi-purpose projects, apart from the hydro. So our idea is basically to go for multi-purpose projects, which will also add into irrigation, into the flood moderation yeah. downstream, also restoring your flora and fauna, biodiversity. There are so many other uh, unstrategic importance, as we all know, in the Northeast. So these are the things, and the, uh, the damage that you are saying that is caused in downstream. This can all be taken care of if these big projects come up in the upper reaches, middle and lower reaches as we have planned. And there will be more plans coming up basically. More projects are being taken up uh, in the higher regions, Thank towards you the border much. areas. Thank you and all the best. We'll take one more Madam, question. Madam, there is a yeah? uh, and we'll take one from behind because we have another presentation. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Second largest uh, distance asset for us is the Sinner Thermal Power Project. So you just talked about the, there is a process that is started again after court basis. So would it see in next one year project being started uh, fully because it's a, it was a near completion 
when the everything went out of the way. So can you throw some light? Because uh, our provision is largest in also in this Sinner power projects. That Sinner power project is around 12, 1350 megawatt, five units of 270 megawatt. So this project has been taken into NCLT, as you may be aware. So our first instructions from COC side to the RP is to make the units operational, at least two units operational. So that uh, because the coal transportation, there is a limitation, the coal siding, railway siding is not available. Railway. So by road only the coal can be transported. So the first instruction is to make two units operational. So RP is working towards that. That's what I would like to say. And, and the resolution process is on the way. It is in excess of 50. 75 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 50. 80%. 80%. 80%. Ah, yes, we'll take one last question over there before we move on to our next presentation. in flow uh, because of the inclusion in JP Morgan index. How PFC is poised to capture that? She also talked about the rupee, advantages of the rupee. So apparently the cost of hedging is also come down and it's a great opportunity. And Mr. Tiwari and also the CEO, if you can mention it, how we are poised for that. Point number two, again Mr. Tiwari, what is the thought? We are the largest NBFC. You have very clearly said, but apparently very undervalued with a high yield and very low price to book. Uh, it can improve further if there is a consolidation. Today there are two companies and there's a lot of cross-holding. So Mr. Tiwari, how you can influence the biggest shareholder that is government? Because I know you can answer that and it can further improve the valuation from just seven... Uh, uh, P or you know forecasted just 5 P and uh, being the largest one that is not reflected clearly but you have come post COVID you answered everything and wish you all the best my name is Manoj Alim Chandani thank you so much I think you have uh, raised two questions one was on the JP Morgan index so we have already seen valuations going up after the declaration and we expect that it will further be post result and looking at the overall power sector scenario. On the rupee, yes, I agree that the government has announced, but the market is still to be developed. So it is not only that we desire to raise funds from outside market in rupee, but it is also important that for the other party, lend the person who, or the institution lending to us, how does it make uh, a commercially viable proposition because all are we are raising purely on the strength of balance sheet of PFC's balance sheet we don't have any support from government of India in this regard so it, it has to be a commercially viable proposition for both the parties on the if you allow me I, I would like to answer on behalf of Mr. Tiwari on the consolidation front yes there is an issue of Holco discount and how you are seeing that the stock is underpriced. You know, at that time of acquisition, the, intention, the logical conclusion for the acquisition was the merger of the two companies. But somehow, due to lot many other priorities of the government, be it COVID, be it economic situation or other factors, somehow this issue was put on the back burner and we are waiting for our uh, owners or the majority shareholders whenever maybe in the times to come, whenever a thought process is put on this, so we will get the uh, direction in this regard. You know that there are certain issues also with the deal which are required to be addressed. So I think 
a lot of thought process is required before taking any further action. Thank you. Thank you very much for your active participation in this Q&A. Now I would like to invite Mr. Mayank Bharadwaj from UCED Sarib to deliver a presentation on India's energy transition outlook. Mr. Mayank Bharadwaj is an energy and infrastructure expert with more than 15 years of experience in financial appraisal and transaction advisory and is currently leading the clean energy investment mobilization vertical of SARIP. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I would just like to thank PFC for giving Sarip this opportunity to, you know, present this compelling case, as we call, for clean energy investment in India. Uh, I'll uh, primarily cover the growth story, how the power sector has grown over the years, what are the future you know, drivers for growth, uh, some of the targets that the government has already uh, announced the policies and uh, some assessment on what the investment potential looks like. Uh, so this is how the power sector has uh, grown uh, in India. If you see uh, about 4x growth in the installed capacity over the last 20 years, there has been uh, almost a 2.4x increase in per capita consumption and a similar uh, growth we have seen in the transmission and distribution lines. So last 20 years, this is the story. And it gets much very more interesting, like I think Sir said, on it's expected to double uh, in the next 10 years or so. Uh, now, uh, if I look at some of the drivers, some of the growth drivers, uh, now if I look at some of the growth drivers that are there, uh, uh, for this. Uh, one is the policy, the government policies that have created this conducive atmosphere for uh, investment. Uh, you can look at that India still is at about 1.2 uh, in per capita consumption. There's a huge potential there. Uh, we are still about 50% of the world average. That is the second one. The population growth, again, expected to put a CAGR of around 7% in the overall electricity consumption. As I mentioned, current capacity of 442 gigawatt expected to become 900 gigawatt in the next six to seven years. Already achieved the COP21 target, uh, which was there, nine years uh, ahead of schedule. So again, a good market, growth drivers, everything in place. The government has already announced uh, the target. So it's a push that has come, a voluntary push that has come, net zero by 2070. Second, uh, as Sir also mentioned on 500 gigawatt of capacity, non-fossil capacity by 2030. Reduction in GDP emissions capacity by 45%. We have already reached, or we are nearing the 200 gigawatt capacity in non-fossil uh, RE site, which is there, which is about 45% of the current uh, installed capacity of India. Already the 33% reduction in GDP from 2005 levels have been achieved. So we are well uh, entrenched, we are well on our path to get and possibly get onto the energy transition. So the energy transition is, is real, it's happening, it's just a question of scaling it up further, just taking that extra push. These are uh, some of the sectors uh, which will drive this growth. Uh, the renewable energy, most of us know about it. The EV and the charging infrastructure, the e-mobility, that will come in. The green energy corridors, uh, the RE-linked transmission system that is there. And the, as we call it, the new kid on the block, green hydrogen, uh, which is there. Uh, if I look at the Kanda uh, RE, uh, the renewable energy, uh, we're looking at almost 24%, 15% large amounts of growth, annual CAGR that are there. Uh, around a 3.5x growth is required in solar, a 2x growth required in wind, and a 6 uh, 12x growth required in the storage segment. Again, storage, as you know, very important to get 
the RE penetration or to get RE integrated into the system. Government policies, uh, they have been there. The PLI, the production-linked incentive schemes for manufacturing of solar, which is there. The Kusum scheme and the recently the Surya Yojana that was uh, announced, especially for the rooftop solar, expected to drive the growth further into this, uh, into the RE segment. The energy storage, VGF, the viability gap funding has been announced. It is there. The tenders are already out. Uh, also, uh, there is a promotion. There is... Uh, the incentive scheme going on for manufacturing of battery that is also in place. The advanced cell chemistry, as we call it, the battery manufacturing, the pieces of the puzzle are actually lining up. Uh, also, uh, some of the uh, policies which were expected, like the RPO, uh, 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 the RPO uh, obligation for the discoms, they have been notified till 2030, and. Uh, the national repowering wind policy also actually came into the picture that is notified again to revive the wind sector to have because wind again location specific and uh, requires a lot of assessment so that is one it's expected to uh, push and revive the wind sector uh, offshore is another one that will expect it to come up later this year or maybe at the start of the next year uh, green energy corridor, the RE-linked uh, transmission system, as we see, uh, the interstate waivers on the interstate energy charges, transmission charges, is, is already in place uh, for RE and now also for the green hydrogen sector. The open access rules for green energy also notified contracted capacity reduced from 1 megawatt to 100 kilowatt hour. Uh, this is what the story looks like. Uh, $337 billion required in the next seven to eight years. Most of it, 50% in the solar space. And additionally, about $29 billion are required for the green energy corridor uh, that is there. Uh, if I move on, uh, e-mobility. Electric mobility, uh, the government has already announced the target of EV30 at 30. So new vehicle sales should comprise of 30% of electric vehicles by 2030. We have seen growth uh, in this area, so about 50% uh, of, uh, there's, been, there's been a 50% rise in 2023 in the sales uh, as compared to 2022. Uh, right now we have charging stations in the range of about 16,000, 16,500, and uh, increase of about 80 times is required by 2030. So to reach a figure of 1.3 million charging stations. Again, a very uh, promising opportunity. On the electric bus segment, uh, it's again a USD $10 billion investment right now as per the National Electric Bus Program, uh, where about 50,000 electric buses are to be deployed. India has about 20 lakh three buses, 23 lakh buses. So you can imagine the market potential for the electric bus segment. Government uh, of India, in collaboration with the U.S. government, also has uh, is you know planning to set up a payment security for mitigating the risks associated with payment delays by the state transport undertakings. This again will mitigate the investor risk, make more projects more bankable, and get the banks and the financing institutions to uh, finance those projects. Fame uh, scheme one and two again capital subsidy was provided for setting up charging infrastructures for buying it two wheelers and three wheelers, which were there. Overall, 192 billion investment opportunity in the next six to seven years. About three billion dollars expected to come in charging infra and uh, around 177 in the vehicle production place, which will also include a lot of, or a majority part, of the electric bus. Green hydrogen, again, a uh, big opportunity, $100 billion. Uh, next eight years, which is required. The government has already come up with a national green hydrogen mission, already put in around $3 billion on the table, as under the site program, as we call it, wherein they have come up and put up uh, the grant, the subsidy on the table to attract this $100 million in the next six to seven years. 
five uh, met million metric tons domestic capacity by 2030 that is required. Electrolyzer manufacturing and uh, hydrogen projects, growth, uh, hydrogen production projects are already uh, awarded. Incentives are already rolled out around 1500 megawatt per year for electrolyzer production and about 4 lakh uh, tons of green hydrogen product, uh, green hydrogen projects, production projects already uh, have been awarded by the government under the scheme. Uh, primarily, uh, the hydrogen uh, sector, the use cases are in the areas of chemical manufacturing, industrial uses, fertilizers, petroleum, and uh, energy storage. So this is what we're talking about, uh, $656 billion uh, investment. Uh, again, eight years, uh, so you can imagine the quantum of investment that we're talking about. That's why I was calling it a compelling uh, investment uh, opportunity, something which uh, people should not miss, uh, something which people should participate in to become uh, part of the India's energy transition story. Again, uh, most of it uh, expected to go into the renewables, about 50%, uh, around $336 million, followed by uh, electric mobility, another $190 billion. Now, I have talked about all the good stuff. Uh, what's the challenge? So uh, some of the challenges that are emerging is that we have uh, been able to achieve those 10 gigawatts, those 12 gigawatts, those 15 gigawatts of renewable capacity addition year on year. And we are very comfortable uh, in doing that. The question remains, can we actually scale it up to 40 gigawatt or 45 gigawatt annually? Uh, if you look at the last two years, uh, in 2022, uh, FY23, we were able to achieve around 15 gigawatt, 15 to 16 gigawatt of RE capacity. Last year, FY24 we were able to reach 20 gigawatt. But now the question is, can we further scale it up to 40, 45, and reach that uh, target of 500 gigawatt or not? Uh, as RE penetrates, as the composition of RE increases in the energy supply, the integration of storage becomes very crucial. So again, the question is on how, where the storage can come in, and what are the opportunities and how the gov and how the government policies actually uh, implements on the ground that is one area so again development of adequate storage capacity becomes very very crucial for more and more re penetration to come in and last piece the low cost funds for the emerging technologies again very crucial for enhancing the adoption accelerating the adoption of uh, such technologies making them more competitive uh, in respect to the conventional uh, uh, you know ice vehicles or conventional hydrogen uh, production uh, processes that are there so that again remains a challenge one of the biggest challenges to really uh, come up and uh, you know reach those 2030 targets this becomes one of the major issues one of the major parameters which needs to be looked at uh, so why why transition? I, I mentioned and I've covered that uh, piece together on there's already an enabling policy environment. The ambitious goals, the NDCs have been uh, announced by the government. It's a strong domestic demand, as I mentioned. There is export competitiveness, uh, which is there. The support infrastructure already is there in place. Uh, for example, a lot of re link transmission, as I mentioned, already in place so that more and more RE can come up. So th those are some of the major uh, factors, some of the major uh, you know, support that why uh, the India's energy transition story uh, is there and why uh, one should actually invest in it. So uh, where is PFC? And I think uh, it, we have discussed that today. So PFC has always been uh, at the forefront and is actually, in a way, contributing and driving this energy transition story uh, of India. Uh, more than 30 years, uh, three decades of experience uh, in power sector, and now diversification into the infra space as well. 
the long tenure loans which are there 10 years and 15 years actually gel very well with uh, the overall uh, concept of asset liability mismatch i think we all know about that uh, leading re lender uh, it's there supported almost 25% of uh, india's re uh, capacity and lastly uh, it has uh, helped or it has uh, lent uh, to sectors like re it has lent to sectors like e mobility and energy efficiency and now it's in a good position or a great position actually to put it all together and scale up further uh, into these sectors giving or pushing the clean uh, energy transition or the india's energy transition story forward uh that's it uh, thank you and uh, in case there are any questions uh, i'll be happy to take those questions here yeah. Yeah, uh, you heard my question. Yeah, 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 I heard your question. So uh, right now, uh, the green hydrogen we are somewhere in the region of USD four to five uh, dollars uh, per kg. That is there, which is again, uh, you know, we you need to be at least less than two to you know come make it more competitive. So those, you know, the uh, what I mentioned about the policies, the incentives that the government is providing, those are expected to. drive it down if you look at us the inflation act that that came in uh, the target is to take it below 1 dollar in the next 6 to 7 years so that is what the us is targeting uh, there is no per se target or no timeline for india but uh, in the next 3 to 4 years because it is expected to uh, you know i'll uh, <laughs> bite the bullet it may uh, reduce to those levels of uh, 2 to 3 dollars yeah but it will happen over a 3 to 4 year period yeah you also made a important reference to export competitiveness right could you just describe in some detail as to where does this export competitiveness arise from in right. terms of india's capabilities and um, sure. how do we see this uh, uh, being exported given the fact that there would be considerable barriers towards importing dirty energy so to speak right so Correct. Mm -hmm. so uh, export competitiveness i was you know if if i look at uh, primarily green hydrogen or green ammonia pieces uh, there are two or three factors one factor which is very uh, important is land right uh, if you look at japan and korea uh, again land is is a major issue so that is that is one piece wherein comes in second is the renewable energy tariffs right so india's uh, tariffs the renewable energy tariffs are one of the lowest in the world right now which is a major component of actually producing green hydrogen it it constitutes about 40 to 45 40 to 45% of the cost and third is you know the the labor cost which is there which we harp on on a lot of things so i think these are some maybe three factors uh, that you can consider which will have that export comp competitiveness factor I can give you a little bit of idea on this on export competitiveness. We are targeting to export green hydrogen to Japan, to Singapore, to Germany, and uh, similar other countries, even Korea, because they have the problem as he's just explained, and uh, we have advantage there. And uh, these countries are very keen on green hydrogen, for which they are also. Uh, likely to share the carbon credit generated out of it some of the carbon credits they will adjust on, on their ndcs and a portion of it will put it on our ndcs nationally determined contributions so this kind of agreement are going to be uh, signed between these three countries we are actually processing it <coughs> pursuing it 
and uh, very soon we'll see that carbon credit will also be one of the factors for competitiveness. So I think uh, un other factors he has already explained. Yeah. So these are the major markets we are actually looking at. So you had a question? So your view on the downside, because you have seemed to have done a very deep dive into the thing, you know, very good, and the CEO can also something. Uh, I will uh, not, uh, you know, uh, answer on behalf of PFC. I yeah. can just give you my perspective that uh, the downside is there uh, in, 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 a, in a way uh, because uh, the RE intermittency, that is one of the biggest challenges which is there. And, if you're not able to have that adequate storage capacity in place, this is going to be somewhat of a, of a challenge, that is one. Uh, second piece is obviously the growth factor of India, right? Now, if the growth factor of India is outpacing your capacity addition or the other pieces, then you'll have to look at it from that perspective. Uh, third is e-mobility, right? Now, when you start to transition from your normal ice to electric mobility there is going to be a lot of demand you know which is generated now how do we cater to that and whether we are ready so just just some of top of the things you know that come up which may have a negative impact on uh, on this story maybe uh, if uh, this is from my uh, experts uh, you know perspective rest if ma'am wants to add to something like uh, this. let me just add yeah. to his what he's saying. The storage is the biggest challenge as one today in what you are asking as the downside. It is not a downside but a challenge which we'll, we'll meet. Already with US, Indo-US task force has been created to look into the chemistry of this battery storage. Whether it is for the grid scale battery storage or for the mobility for this or scoot scooties and uh, four wheelers. So this battery, which actually uses lithium, which is a rare earth material or critical mineral, this is a challenge for us. So we are also exploring the alternative chemistry, sodium-based and other kinds of battery storage, for which India and US both are working together. And this is a very unique uh, kind of energy storage task force, ESTF, which has been created during our prime minister's talk with the president, US president last time when our Prime Minister visited. So this is a very at the very high level which has been decided. So I think uh, this task force is already working in the industry. It is housed in the Indian industry, not with the government. So uh, this is working overnight. And we are going to come up with those solutions. And we have a lot of startups in our country. So I think this challenge will also be and uh, USAID is also the part of the story of the entire work that the way we are working on the storage part, battery part basically. Your take. We as a financial institution, I think a lot of work is being done on the technological improvement to make these technologies as viable. So we are already there. And as I think earlier also our director project said, that we are waiting those com these technologies to be commercially viable. So initially, we will go with the caution. And once these are fully commercially viable, then we are open to funding all these opportunities. Perfect. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Uh, tell about the startup, uh, which has already worked upon in India, IIT Bombay, IIT Roorkee, and uh, this energy storage task force, the industry, they are working together to create, to scale it up from the startup uh, in IIT Roorkee campus and also IIT Bombay. So that is how we have actually worked out. And very soon you will see that we are scaling it up, making it commercially viable, and India will show the way in the alternative chemistry of the batteries. Sure. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. I think that was really a very active participation over there. And I'm sure a couple of people behind were deprived uh, of asking questions because we were only looking at the ones in the front. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us. Thank you very much. Do join us for high tea and have a lovely evening. Take care.